Welcome to Tucker Carlson. Today, it wasn't that long ago that the United States had an entire class of people known roughly as public intellectuals, philosophers. Now, a lot of them even then were buffoons, but not all. They were some serious people. That whole class is gone. Those who took their place study and talk about mostly themselves, their identity. It's narcissism, not philosophy. One of the very few left operating in the shadows of the internet, needless to say, is a man called Curtis Yarvin. For years, he blogged under the name Mencius Moldbug. Now, we should say that Curtis Yarvin has a job. He's a software developer. But purely because he had something to say, he wrote about a million words for free on the internet about his life philosophy. Now, Personally, I would be lying if I said I understood all of it, don't have the necessary IQ to claim that. But I can say, having read a lot of it, it's interesting as hell, provocative, gets you thinking, and more than anything, adds needed perspective on the moment we're in now. For the crime of saying interesting things, Curtis Yarvin has been hounded nonstop by the people who write Wikipedia, by the banks, by the people who maintain the status quo at all costs. We think, particularly because we have a full hour, that it would be worth talking to Curtis Yarvin about what he makes of the moment we're living in right now. By the way, if you're interested in reading more, he writes on Substack. It's called Gray Mirror is his feed, I guess, on Substack. Anyway, Curtis Yarvin, a genuinely interesting person. We're honored to have him with us today. Thank you for that lovely intro, uh, Tucker. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be <laughs> No, this is one of those conversations. Does that where, sound too fake? Was that too fake? I just said, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not even, I, I just have wanted to have you on because I think you're really interesting. I don't understand everything that you're arguing. I don't know if I agree with it or not, but I do know that you're considered highly controversial mm -hmm. um, by people, which is almost always a sign that you are saying things that are worth thinking about. I don't think I've read a lot of your stuff. I don't think you're a hater in any sense. You're not calling for anyone to be heard. I don't think you're crazy. I think you're pretty far out in a way that is worth thinking about. Anyway, thank you for coming. I, 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 I appreciate this. I think actually just to put the, uh, you know, uh, I, I think the best slur out there is that if you read my Wikipedia biography, um, it basically has me saying that black people should be enslaved because they're congen congenitally stupid. Um, that's a, which is a remarkable thing to say. Actually, I think that's what my bank canceled me for. And it's if you actually read the place that it's coming from, it's this sort of beautiful conjuncture of two sort of completely separate things, neither, neither of which says that. And but if you sort of read it straight out, kind of stereotypically, you read that. And I'm just like, this is beautiful. I'm well, like, this is a beautiful work of propaganda directed at me. But it's me. such a it's, slur. I mean, oh, you know, I know, I know, I know. Children and, uh, and yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think, I think, I think, I think. Recently, my son actually got canceled from his soccer team uh, for that. I'm not sure, but there was something like that. It worked out well in the end. Um, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a remarkable experience, sort of, and. In a way, like when I look at the things that, you know, sort of out of this million words that you get sort of noticed or canceled for, you basically learn not how to not do these things and how to not create the opportunities right. for these kinds of strange constructions. But it's just so but, interesting that they want, and I, I can't overstate this since for our audience that reads, you know, t take an hour and read Curtis Yarvin, and it's, it, it, it bears no resemblance to the way that it's characterized, but it's interesting that they focused on you to shut you down. You're clearly saying things that threaten them. So let's just give our viewers a taste of what you actually think. So our withdrawal from Afghanistan devolved immediately into a profound humiliation for the United States and the American empire, such as it is. Take three steps back as a philosopher and assess what this tells us about our current system and well, our leaders. Whenever you're humiliated, um, it should be always be a learning experience. Yes, you're, you're being as a person, you're being humiliated because you learned something that was painful to you yes. that you didn't want to know or didn't want to be reminded of. Yes, um, and, and and that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing having been 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 humiliated, and it's a beautiful and necessary and wonderful thing. And there are two kinds of people 
who respond to humiliation in two different ways. Either basically they take that in and they're like, okay, what was it that I learned that was so painful and how do I avoid making the same mistake again and getting humiliated again in the same way? Or, you know, they're sort of more the narcissistic type and they go into this kind of narcissistic rage where they're just like, I never want to hear it. They blame the messenger, essentially. <laughs> right. and, 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 and they blame the messenger. And, and so, you know, with sort of the fall of Afghanistan, I think that there are a lot of people who still think of the U.S. government as having the competence that it had 50 years ago, 70 years ago, even in the fall of Saigon, which was basically a masterpiece compared to this. Yeah. And, 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 and so they look at this, you know, these are Americans out there and they have a kind of, you know, deeply ritual association with the real Washington. And both of us have a family background in the real Washington. Yes. And so, you know, what they think of... And pause there and, and just tell our, our viewers what your background is. Oh, um, um, you know, my dad was a foreign service officer, which is, uh, so I went around living in embassies and consulates around the world. I was kind of a... Uh, an international Jew, you might say. Actually, I always wanted like a lifetime subscription to International Jew Magazine. Can't you see it? Um, you know, but I was I'm I'm a rootless cosmopolitan. So um, so you know, so I, I grew up really in the belly of this beast, right? And the thing is, it's like, for example, I was recently out. I, I drove across the country in both directions with my kids. An incredible experience and um, beautiful, amazing country. We were driving through. Iowa, you know, on July 4th and all around, all the little towns start sending up their fireworks, you know, boom, boom, whatever. We went to the July 4th rodeo in Livingston, Montana. Yeah. You know, there were, and they even dared to like, you know, the announcer even like talk trash about the liberal media. You know, you know so they, they basically, they, they know that something's up, you know, yeah. in a way. And yet, you know, you have sort of all of the paraphernalia of patriotism that you sort of feel so deeply. Out there, and this patriotism is this kind of ritual, sort of religious allegiance. It's like if you're a Catholic, it isn't necessarily because you love the personal habits of the Pope, right? Right, and you know, or you're you're down on like Vatican politics or whatever. So you know, the sort of the difference that that kind of I think needs to be exploded for a lot of people is what is the difference between sort of my ritual respect for this thing and what it actually is. Because when I actually look at you know, what the Vatican is, or in this case, the swamp, the deep state, as the cathedral, as I've sometimes called it, you know, the sort of the, the oligarchic power structure of America, which is completely decentralized, there is no center to it anywhere, there is no like they, there is no one you can point to, there's no race or class or little meeting of like protocols of elders of Zion that's happening, right. there's no conspiracy, it's completely decentralized. That's what makes it so hard to kill. And, and, yes. um, and so when you look at the way this ruling class works and governs, it's a very different thing from these sort of abstractions that you learn in 11th grade civics class. And, you know, and when you grow up in that, in it, you feel it, you know, extremely intensely. And so, for example, people will go and they'll vote for president and they'll, you know, they sort of vote as if who was sitting in the White House, you know, was who was in power. And they'll use these terms like, you know, Trump is in power, Biden is in power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, guys, Americans, when you're inside the belly of this beast and you look at the White House as an organization, and the White House is not even really properly controlled by the president, uh, you know, the White House's whole budget and organization is set by Congress. It's full of permanent employees. It's not even, but if you look at the White House as a whole and measure its kind of relevance to the normal process of the executive branch, of the actual government that people like our parents lived and worked in, you're like, it has almost no relevance at all. In the, in the deep state, uh, you know, as Americans, it's a Turkish word that Americans have learned to use, it's a great word. Um, you know, in the deep state, the way you regard this election, this stupid, really, ceremony that happens over there that's like for, the, there's a clown show for the clowns, it's like a storm on the surface above a coral reef. You're a fish in the reef, you know, you're going about your fishy business, um, you know, you're eating algae or whatever, there's a big storm, you know, you, you're kind of sucked back and forth a little bit, you feel it, you know, it makes it a little harder to nibble algae, but like waves are not breaking on you. Yeah. And so waves are not breaking on you down there. And so when people look at this thing, you know, they sort of make this 
kind of couple of mistakes. They're like, okay, we elected Trump, so Trump's in power. I'm like, well, if you took that phrase literally and you said Trump is in power, for example, Trump is the chief executive of the executive branch. One way philosophically to think about this question is how much power does Donald Trump personally have over this executive branch? That's a hard thing to measure, but one way to measure this is to know that it has two endpoints. So he could have no power or he could have complete power. He could have zero or one. So where is he in his power over the executive branch, which constitutionally is under his complete control? Where is he in terms of his power over this organization? Is he closer to zero or closer to one? So one way to ask that question is to say, well, could we increase his power by 10 times? Could we make the White House 10 times as powerful over the executive branch? Very easily. Could we imagine, you know, at that point, we're reaching the powers of, say, LBJ? Could we make the White House 100 times as powerful over the executive branch? At this point, we're up to the powers of FDR. So, you know, people think when they vote for Donald Trump that they're voting for the same job that FDR had. They're actually voting for, like, 0.01% of that job, which is a, right, like, a really serious, like, that is a really serious misinterpretation of reality. And foisting that level of a misinterpretation of reality on people is actually, it's a really serious offense. It's really not good. And so getting- Why, why is it not good? It's not good because you're gaslighting people. They're living in, they're basically looking at the simulated world. One way, to, one way to think about this question, I will get back to Afghanistan. Yeah. One way to think about this question is to, and this is a very fundamental question of political science. Um, this is, um, I'm a member or uh, a, a votary of what, what some call the Italian school of political science or the Machiavellian school. Um, I want to just pimp check the out best my intro Machiavellian this school videos. that is available, which is The Machiavellians by James Burnham, um, written in 1940. It's actually his best book. Most people say The Managerial Revolution, which is really not as good in my opinion. It's good, but this is amazing. And Burnham is basically like, look, you have to assume that you're living in The Truman Show. You have to assume that the entire nature of political reality may not be as you conceive it at all. And so, you know, you're electing Trump or you're electing Biden and you're thinking, you know, you're sort of changing the course of the nation. You're actually kind of moving these fish in the coral reef, you know, back and forth a few inches with, you know, the big waves you think you're generating. Um, and you're making a misinterpretation of reality, which is like someone who thought that Queen Elizabeth II was actually in charge of the UK. And so everybody knows when they look at the Queen of England that the Queen of England does not actually run the government and cannot right. say off with his head and all of the things that a, a queen queen could do. They know she's not a queen. They know she's basically just a um, very classy Kardashian. Yeah. Sorry, we're off filming. Uh, you know, um, as, a, as, as a monarchist, I'm never going to live this one down. But, um, um, you, know, you know, they know that she's just a very classy Kardashian. And the thing is that legally, you know what Queen Elizabeth II can do? She can veto an act of parliament. She actually has the right to veto just like the president does. Do you know when that, that power was last used? It was last used, I believe, in something like 1707 by Queen Anne. And what the British did was, I mean, this is a very old thing. What the British did was they basically had all of this conflict in the 17th century between, you know, the sort of the old, the Stuart monarchy and the rising middle classes. And the eventual solution was that they replaced the real monarchy with a fake monarchy. Right. Which, you know, had no actual sort of real power. And this was kind of, this transition was like through William of Orange and Queen Anne. And a lot of people hoped that Queen Anne, who was actually a Stuart, would restore the Stuarts. And of course she didn't. Um, and so at that time, this myth that here you have the king or the queen and they're actually in charge, but they're actually fake. This is an active weapon of deception. Right up to World War II, people are like charging, who, who would die for the queen now? Like for this like, you know, uh, classy Kardashian, right? In World War I, guys are going, you know, over the top across the trenches for, you know, the king. And, and they actually, you know, this legend is sort of more and more believed. And at the equivalent of like the rodeo, whatever they do in England in like 1910, people are like, you know, they stand up for this royal whatever. 
this is a country that has ceased to be that ceased to be a monarchy in any kind of real functioning way in 1688. So people can really very much misunderstand the system of government that that they live in, and and feel you know if you're like. One way, very simple way to sort of think about, you know, the question of democracy is you can ask two questions. Do we live in a democracy and should we? You will find very, very few people who answer no to both of those questions. And so if you look at the question of basically... Do but you, you will find many who will answer no to the first question. Yes. You will find many who will answer no to the first question, but there are ways of giving that answer are sort of biased by their feeling that living in a, in a democracy is the way this should work. And so when they look at, you know, why they often, so people, let's say, you know, how do you hack an election? So, you know, people will be like, oh, you go into the voting machines or you print up, you know, spare ballots in, in China or whatever. No, you know, these are rookie these are rookie numbers. Like, this is not how you hack, hack an election. The way you hack an election is by changing the meaning of the election. And the way you hack an election is not by changing, eliminating your ability to vote for a certain candidate, but by simply taking away the power from the politicians you elect. In other words, turning them from Elizabeth I, who actually could say off of your head, to Elizabeth II. And so when you look at the legal positions that Elizabeth the first and Elizabeth the second occupied, they're exactly the same position. She's the queen. Yeah. Like, you know, she's, she has, you know, uh, and technically in the English constitutional system, it's called reserve powers. She could declare martial law tomorrow. Like, you know, and, and actually I think it would work. <laughs> and uh, that's a separate conversation.